So, of course, I want to first thank uh, Lika, Maya and all the organizers for this invitation. It's really great to be here. I really look forward to discussing my work with you all. Um, the question I want to pose for us to uh, discuss this morning is how feminist and queer politics should confront um, neoliberalism. Now, to pose such a question presupposes that neoliberalism is a notion with some real explanatory power as well as political efficacy. Many contemporary political theorists have claimed that neoliberalism has become a mere buzzword, um, mostly deployed by critics who are starkly divided over issues of its definition, origin and provenance. It's used as a confusing catch-all for anything that smacks of deregulation, liberalization, privatization or uh, fiscal austerity. So I will therefore begin by explicating a specific Foucauldian understanding of neoliberalism. My contention is that uh, Michel Foucault's uh, lectures on neoliberalism, The Birth of Biopolitics, delivered in 1979, offer a novel conceptual and theoretical framework for the critical analysis of neoliberalism. Um, according to his view, a key aim of neoliberal governance is the formation of new kinds of political subjects who act as individual entrepreneurs across all dimensions of their lives. So individuals are governed through the free and rational choices that they themselves make in the politically constructed conditions of competition and in response to various economic incentives and disincentives. I aim to show why such a theoretical understanding of neoliberalism is important for feminist and queer politics. I will analyze the construction of feminine and queer subjects in their neoliberal forms and draw some political consequences from my analysis. I will conclude by arguing that feminist and queer politics today have to not only attack neoliberal economic policy, but the whole overarching neoliberal framework in which the measure of our liberation has become the individual consumer choices that we are able to make. It should be noted at the outset that my analysis of neoliberalism here is limited to Western Europe and North America. In other words, a limited number of liberal capitalist countries that have been through significant economic restructuring along neoliberal lines over the last three or four decades. The full impact of the neoliberal turn has of course been global and it has been convincing, convincingly argued by others that many of its most far-reaching and detrimental con effects have in fact been borne by the people in the global south. Uh, a global analysis of neoliberalism is unfortunately the beyond, of, uh, beyond the scope of this paper. However, I hope that in the discussion um, we can make some observations and comparisons uh, with your specific situation here in Georgia and maybe exchange some ideas. So I would be very interested to hear about how, um, what kinds of forms have the, has the neoliberal turn taken here. Okay. In the theoretical critiques of neoliberalism, commentators commonly distinguish between two main approaches, the neo-Marxist and the Foucauldian governmentality approaches. Both approaches have spawned an extensive, re extensive research agendas and a substantial corpus of work. The neo-Marxist approaches treat neoliberalism as a strictly economic transformation in the structural conditions of capitalism in Western Europe and the US. 
The diagnosis varies slightly, but the recession in the early 1970s, the oil crisis, and the collapse of the Bretton Woods Accord are usually identified as decisive events. The key idea is that the pre-existing economic arrangements for ensuring capitalist accumulation were exhausted or had proven deficient and new ones were urgently required to restart and revitalize the process. In his influential study, The Condition of Postmodernity, David Harvey, for example, argues that neoliberalism was essentially an economic mutation resulting from the inevitable crisis of profitability in capitalism and leading to drastic economic restructurings of scale and space. The Foucauldian approach, on the other hand, views neoliberalism not merely as an economic transformation, but primarily as a political project, a set of governmental techniques and strategies that aim to extend economic evaluation and market rationality to all aspects of social life. In other words, neoliberalism is a response not only to economic problems, but also to social, political, and even moral problems. And this response takes historically contingent and variegated forms. So instead of providing a single unified explanation for the neoliberal turn, the governmentality literature analyzes the multiple and shifting governmental uh, uh, techniques, um, as well as the actual political and institutional configurations in which the neoliberal reforms, institutions and ideas have appeared in different geographical locations and historical situations. Neoliberalism thus denotes a wide repertoire of governmental techniques which are implemented in different ways in the messy and agonistic social field. A key aspect of this form of governance is, however, the formation of new kinds of neoliberal subjects. Neoliberal governmentality is understood as a particular mode of producing subjects who act as individual entrepreneurs across all dimensions of their lives. They are understood as self-interested and rational beings who will navigate the social realm by making choices based on economic knowledge and the strict calculation of uh, necessary costs and desired benefits. As Foucault notes, the individual's life itself must make him into a sort of a permanent and multiple enterprise. So neoliberal governmentality aims to organize and regulate populations essentially through the management of their liberty. Individuals are governed through the rational, calculative and seemingly free choices that they themselves make in the politically constructed conditions of competition and in response to various economic incentives and disincentives. While it's important to acknowledge that in his lectures on neoliberalism, Foucault analyzes for the most part theories and rationalities rather than their actual empirical outcomes, I think ex empirical and experiential evidence gives weight to the theoretical claim that the neoliberal reorganization of Western societies has resulted in new forms of the subject, a new understanding of ourselves. Neoliberal governmentality has dramatically extended the reach of the markets and market rationality and thereby produced the corresponding subjects who are compelled to behave as consumers, investors and entrepreneurs. Whether we focus on the reforms of pension plans and healthcare, revisions of copyright laws or the restructuring of universities, individuals are increasingly required to view themselves as market actors and to behave accordingly. The new forms of govern governance and social regulation are thus misrecognized as insofar as they are identified as lack of governance and viewed merely as lifestyle choices. The social practices in which individuals must engage daily 
in order to go about their lives are essentially material practices embedded in law and political institutions as well as in everyday social relationships. The dominance in, in some, the dominance of neoliberalism means that we are confronted with the new kind of social reality. Okay, so if we accept the Foucauldian claim that I have outlined so far, that neoliberal governmentality produces new kinds of subjects, what does this imply for the subjects of feminism and queer politics? Foucault's key contribution to critical social and political theory in the 1980s and 90s was his idea of productive power. Any analysis of power relations must recognize how these relations are constitutive of the subjects involved in them. His genealogical investigations showed how subjects were constructed through mundane everyday practices of power as certain kinds of social, political and economic beings. In other words, individuals do not enter the political arena as fully formed subjects who then demand rights and represent interests. The supposedly personal or private aspects of their being are already traversed by power relations which not only restrain them, but produce them as certain kinds of political subjects. Now, it's no exaggeration to say that the consequences of this idea for feminist and queer theory were momentous. If we accept that the political subjects are always, at least partly, produced by power relations, this implies that the subjects of progressive sexual politics, such as feminists or women or queers are also produced by the same oppressive power relations that our political struggles aim to theorize and to ultimately eradicate. Women, for example, becomes a culturally and politically constructed category of oppression, not merely a neutral descriptor of a group. Politically, this implies that it's not enough merely to try to include more women in politics or to seek to represent their interests more effectively. We have to ask more fundamentally how the very foundation of their identity, the category of women, is constituted through practices of power. My contention is that Foucault's insights about the constitutive role of power must remain crucial when we analyze the consequences of the neoliberal turn for feminist and queer politics today. In my book, Feminist Experiences, I have argued that the spread and intensification of neoliberal go governmentality has meant that women too have come to be seen and to see themselves increasingly as neoliberal subjects. Egoistical subjects of interest making free choices based on rational economic calculation. Early feminist demands for, polit for political rights were often repudiated on the grounds that women did not have any political interests separate from those of their husbands and fathers, and therefore they had no need for political representation. Even though women in most liberal democracies have now had equal political rights for almost a century, the idea that all their actions would be driven by calculated self-interest to the express exclusion of all other values has been absent or even structurally impossible in the liberal political paradigm. As Wendy Brown, for example, has argued, the subject of liberalism is a figure of fundamental self-interest and self-orientation and this is quite at odds with what women have been constituted as. The autonomous woman, the childless, unmarried or lesbian woman, has been a sign of disorderly society or of individual failure to adapt to femininity. Such unnatural figures make clearly visible how the social order presumed by liberalism is itself pervasively gendered representing both a gendered division of labor 
and the gender division of the sensibilities and activities of the subjects. Women's traditional role in the family has been to surrender their self-interest so that their husbands and children can attain their autonomous subjectivity. The, con the constitutive terms of liberal political discourse and practice, individual, autonomy, self-interest, these terms fundamentally depend upon their implicit opposition to a subject and a set of activities marked feminine, whilst effectively obscuring this dependence. However, we have now witnessed a significant reconstitution of family kinship and intimate relationships in the recent decades. They too have been permeated by the logic of the market and have become less premised on permanent familial ties. It's not structurally impossible anymore that a significant number of women could be liberal subjects in the full sense of the term not only individual subjects of political rights, but also egotistical subjects of economic interests. Because neoliberal governmentality has brought about the increasing commodification and marketization of the private realm, domestic and caring work, for example, the self-interest of some women can now be bought relatively easily with the subordination and exploitation of others. While we have to recognize that this commodified domestic and caring work is still mostly provided by other women, from a primarily economic perspective, the gender of the care providers is becoming less significant too. Global neoliberal economy relies on women's labor, but also increasingly on the feminization of labor. This widely used but ambiguous concept denotes, on the one hand, the quantitative increase of women in the labor market globally due to the growth of the service industries and the increasing demand for care work. However, it also qualifies, it also denotes a qualitative change in the nature of labor. The characteristics historically pre present in women's work, such as precariousness, flexibility, fragmentary nature, low status and low pay have come to increasingly characterize all work in global capitalism. Hence the irreconcilable dualisms that traditionally constitute political liberalism, public, private, individual, family, autonomy, dependency, self-interest, selflessness, these dualisms do not cut, li cut neatly between the two genders anymore. They have now come to characterize increasingly the psychic life of working women torn between conflicting demands of femininity as well as the internal divisions between different groups of women. Domestic and care work traditionally done by women at home is today increasingly bought from the markets and performed by immigrants and racialized women. Hence, my contention is that women today not only have the rights guaranteed by political liberalism, they have now also largely become the subjects presumed by economic liberalism. Individuals pursuing their own interests and responding primarily to economic gains and losses. It has now become fully conceivable that a woman's interest might not coincide with her husband's and children's interests anymore. Women do not only want a happy home anymore. They too want money, power and success. They are atomic, autonomous subjects competing for the economic opportunities available. The rise of this new feminine neoliberal subject can be described and documented in different ways by analyzing visual culture or sociological data, for example. The sociologist Angela McRobbie, for example, have combined elements of feminist sociology with cultural studies in a provocative attempt to map out the field of post-feminist popular and political culture, mainly within a UK framework. 
She surveys changes in film, television, popular culture, women's magazines, and demonstrates how feminist content had, has disappeared from them in the last decades and has been replaced by aggressive individualism, by hedonistic female phallicism in the field of sexuality, and by obsession with consumer culture. Natasha Walters' new feminism and Ariel Levy's Female Chauvinist Pigs, two popular books targeting mainly wide mainstream audience, document this same shift in cultural attitudes. Walters' book uh, articulates ideas about femininity and feminism that became dominant in the UK during the 1980s and 90s, and it tells a triumphant story of women's economic success. Walters insists that a woman can be a feminist and still have a white wedding, buy pornography, wear designer clothes, or even be a prostitute or porn star, as long as that has been her own choice. In other words, it is irrelevant how women speak, dress, or express sexuality as long as they are pursuing their own interests. For her, the real issues of feminism are about personal freedom, economic independence, and professional success in all areas of employment. In a more critical vein, Levy describes the way that the increasing pornification of all aspects of everyday life is no longer understood in opposition to feminist political goal aims, but is instead seen as evidence that feminism has already achieved its goals. The fact that women too read Playboy and get Brazilian bikini waxes is increasingly understood as a sign of their liberation and empowerment. This fundamental shift in the constitution of the feminine subject implies that women are now governed and subjected through new mechanisms, namely through the harnessing of their economic interests. Normative femininity has become firmly attached to economic gains in a new way. Uh, my contention is that women are increasingly rationalizing their participation in the normative habits of femininity in terms of their own economic interests, not in terms of men's interests. So women no longer have long manicured nails because their male partners find this sexually attractive and arousing, for example, but because manicured nails have now become a sign of professional and financial success, a sign that is likely to help them move forward in their career. Similarly, in interviews with cosmetic surgery patients, for example, one of the main arguments women state for undergoing the operations is the fact that it can be a career move. Feminine appearance has come to be seen um, as an important instrument by which women can increase their human capital. The neoliberal subject views feminine appearance as well as her own body increasingly as an investment for getting the returns she wants. Whereas feminists have traditionally emphasized that successful provision of a beautiful or sexy body could perhaps gain women attention and admiration, but did not result in any real social power. The situation has, at least on the surface level, changed considerably. Walters seems to be right in, in insisting that success in normative feminine appearance is not primar primarily a sign of deference anymore but has become an important sign of economic success and social power. So the link between idealized femininity and economic success has become tight and pronounced. The most successful performances of feminine appearance in our society no longer symbolize subservience, waitresses, flight attendants, or secretaries. The most successful performances of feminine appearance are these days accomplished by women who have power and money, female executives and politicians. 
We live in a world in which appearances are more important than ever, and the modern female cons consumer is very uh, aware of this. We must not be fooled into thinking that this means that the cultural meaning of femininity and its profound tie to subservience and dependency has completely dissolved, however. Nor is it the case that the structural dependence of liberalism on its others, so beings who belong to the realm of familial selflessness and dependency, making the autonomy and selfishness of others possible, that this would have uh, uh, disappeared. As long as our life form is fundamentally centered on families and on a gender division of the sensibilities and activities of the subjects, the neoliberal, purely self-interested feminine subject would signal the collapse of our social order, a, co a collapse that is, in my view, in no way evident. While the defenders of family, family values loudly proclaim such, a, such collapse, we have to acknowledge that normative subservient femininity still continues to largely provide the necessary support for the neoliberal political and economic order. Now this subservient feminine caring work is just increasingly bought from the markets and provided by racialized women. It's nevertheless significant to see that neoliberal governmentality operates with the different logic of gender subjection. Rather than disciplining the female subjects through the normalizing habits connected to shame, social sanctions and sexual rewards, it installs the habit, habits constitutive of normative femininity increasingly through their economic rationality. The focus is on the environmental variables that determine and constrict women's behavior as consumers and entrepreneurs of themselves. Women that still internalize social divisions and power hierarchies through mundane techniques of gender to the extent that they become part of their subjectivities. Only now these techniques, as well as the hierarchies that they mirror and uphold, are portrayed even more effectively as the consequence of individual choice. This shift has resulted in the intensification of these practices. The belief that women are in complete control of their lives, that traditional femininity is their free choice, and that they can achieve anything they want, not in spite of it, but with the help of it, makes them more compliant with normative techniques of gender. If we believe the neoliberal doctrine that subjects do nothing that is not in their own interest. The normative femininity must be what we truly want. This excessive focus on free choice has been perhaps the most insidious aspect of neoliberal governmentality for the subject of feminism. The measure of women's liberation has become the individual choices that we are able to make, to become executives or prostitutes, to have white weddings or to buy pornography. Power is increasingly understood as simply another thing that a woman can choose. Within this framework, the fact that many women choose to stay at home or opt out of more demanding and higher paying employment opportunities is understood straightforwardly as their own free choice. The obvious problem with this excessive focus on choice is that women cannot choose power like they can choose between different wedding dresses. Women have to make their choices in a network of highly unequal power relations that not only restrict their possibilities and options, but construct their very subjectivities. Feminist analyses have shown that women develop their work aspirations and identities, for example, only within the context of and in response to structural features of the work world. The idea that feminine subjects have static interests and identities that precede their choices, as well as the power relations they are engaged in, obfuscates the systemic and constitutive aspects of sexism. It means that, paradoxically, women's belief in unlimited possibilities and freedom of choice makes them more, not less, vulnerable to sexism.
Although my own work has primarily focused on the subject of feminism, a similar argument has been made by others on the subject of queer politics. So prominent queer theorists such as Lisa Duggan, Kevin Floyd, and Peter Drucker have argued that neoliberalism does not attempt to exclude LGBT people from the market sphere. Instead, it has readily seen the economic advantages of accommodating them and viewing them as potential consumers. So Pride Marches today commonly boast sponsorships by corporate entities, while advertisers target new gay and lesbian niche markets. While theorists such as Dicker acknowledge that the commercialization of the LGBT culture has also provided new spaces in which people can explore, act out, and celebrate their same-sex desires, their worry is that it has fostered a new kind of conformism. Participation in a commercialized scene obviously requires the ability to pay and consequently only those who can pay fit in. The neoliberal queer subject is typically a wealthy professional leading a relatively comfortable life in a tolerated corner of a heteronormative world. At the same time, the LGBT people with lower incomes and less economic security are excluded. Uh, here's a quote from Dukas' recent book. While there are profits to be made from LGBT niche markets, they are far more uniform spaces targeting consumers with the most effective demand, where people with the wrong bodies, the wrong clothes, the wrong sexual practices, the wrong gender, or the wrong color skin are viewed as bad for branding and marketing and are regularly excluded. The growth of the commercial scene has thus entailed a rise in stigmatization and marginalization for many LGBT people." Unquote. In his book, The Reification of Desire, Kevin Floyd illustrates this development in the context of New York, where Mayor Giuliani's aggressive cleanup of the city effectively sanitized the openly gay neighborhoods. By closing sex shops, pornographic bookstores, bars and clubs, as well as basically pricing out all but the wealthiest gays from traditionally gay neighborhoods, the boisterous and open queer culture of New York has all but disappeared. So Christopher Street in New York is now home to the wealthy white queer community, while poorer queers, many, many of whom are people of color, are separated into other neighborhoods. This economic stratification has resulted in a much more private and depoliticized community. When commercial spaces serve as outlets for behavior and imaginary perceived as transgressive, this effectively confines them to the realm of private life and free time. So in Lisa Duggan's words, instead of genuine political transformations, we end up with quote, a privatized, depoliticized gay culture anchored in domesticity and consumption, unquote. So similar to the case of feminism, the neoliberal turn has thus made the queer community much more unequal economically with significant political consequences. The economic stratification itself already makes it harder to build unified feminist and queer movements because individuals' life experiences have become so radically diverse. So the white professional female executive is more likely to identify politically with her male co-workers than with the Mexican nanny she has hired. Questions of political solidarity become even more challenging, however, once we adopt the neoliberal framework that emphasizes freedom and rational choice. In this framework, the impediments to individual social and political success are understood as personal or psychological rather than political or structural. So exploitation, domination, and other systemic forms of social inequality are rendered invisible as political phenomena 
to the extent that each, each individual situation is judged as nothing other than the effect of his or her own choices and investments. So some, some situations are the result of just having made bad investments. So neoliberal governmentality makes possible the avoidance of any kind of collective responsibility for social and economic inequality. Because the neoliberal subject is a free atom of self-interest fully responsible for navigating the social realm by using cost-benefit calculation, those who fail to succeed can only blame themselves. Hence, it's important to recognize that the ideas of personal freedom and rational choice that neoliberal governmentality entails are an inter integral aspect of this technique of power. These ideas effectively mask the systemic aspects of power, domination, social hierarchies, systematic discrimination, and economic exploitation. By relegating to the individual the freedom to choose between different options, whilst denying them any possibility for defining or shaping those options. So my contention is that it is paramount that feminists and queer theorists engage in critical analysis of neoliberalism. We have to be able to somehow confront the governmental framework in which the measure of our liberation has become individual economic success and the consumer choices we are able to make. We must demand changes to our political institutions and economic policies, but we also need profound transformations in our everyday social practices, relationships, and ultimately ourselves. We need to foreground again the radical feminist idea that personal is political and acknowledge that it is also through us, our subjectivity, that neoliberal governmentality is able to function. Thank you. Thanks for 
for an uh, excellent question because, of course, this is, in a sense, the dilemma. Perhaps here the dilemma is more pronounced because uh, a lot of women are, in fact, uh, aspiring for some kind of economic success. But I think, in, some, in, in a sense, this same contradiction or, or dilemma is, is the story also in Finland and, and United States, where I live, that, of course, the, 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 the game is set up so that if you want to, to uh, play it, you are, in a sense, caught up in this competitive uh, labor market, in, this, in these various forms of competition that are the organizing principle for various realms of social life. Um, and of course, it's not that any individual woman can somehow solve these big structural contradictions in their own lives. So I'm not, of course, advocating that uh, women should not compete with men for high power jobs or, or visible political positions. Of course they should. But I think it's nevertheless important to recognize uh, what the, the, the double bind is that we are and to try and nevertheless recognize that the success of some women comes at the cost of others. So I'm, I, I mean, I'm sure that also perhaps those women, and I would like to hear more about this, those women in Georgia who have managed to um, get uh, some level of, of maybe not political power, but at least economic success, will have to employ other women to do a lot of housework for them. And this, of course, in a sense, uh, creates a wedge between different groups of women and makes it much harder to build, to build a unified uh, feminist movement based on, on solidarity. So I think it's important that feminists are, in a sense, aware of this situation, a kind of a, a diagnostic and self-awareness, I think, is the first step here. And then, of course, we need to try and um, try and engage in forms of uh, uh, politics and political activism that, in a sense, targets the whole framework. And this is not an easy question. This is something that I want to discuss with you because hopefully my uh, diagnosis shows that it's, it's not only limited what an individual do, but that the, 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 the framework, the rationality that in a sense organizes our social reality goes so deep that also superficial political uh, changes are not really solving the problem. And hopefully in the discussion we can take up some examples of, of what I mean here. But I think it's, it's, it's a very good point that you're making and I would be very interested in hearing more about the, the situation of women in Georgia. Because of course I, I recognize that, uh, that uh, also the economic impediments for women's independence uh, must be very different here. Thank you. You uh, were talking about how uh, nowadays um, women um, take, uh, like, obey the conventional um, um, terms of femininity um, because of the economic rationality. Mm -hmm. um, well, to me, the only difference is that now it's called choice. In other sense, it has always been like that. And, um, yeah, do you see there is any um, change, like, apart from that in that sense because uh, women have had to uh, for centuries and always in, in any era or uh, structure or uh, political um, system they had to um, sure. uh, they simply had no other choice and the second question is um, when you were talking about the, um, the definition of neoliberalism um, as uh, and uh, one of the most important components of um, shifting the responsibility of 
to an individual, individual subject. Um, uh, last year I was reading uh, Melinda Cooper's uh, Family Values and this book actually has affected me a lot uh, because um, uh, her argument about that uh, about this uh, responsibility that the responsibility has not shifted to an individual but a nuclear family um, is really powerful to me and made me look at this uh, in a really different way. If you look at it uh, from the um, historical uh, materialist perspective, so. Um, Thank you. Okay, so so to clarify what I think has changed, I think in some ways, if you think of, uh, of course, women have had to conform to norms of feminine appearance always, and the norms have shifted. But if you think of um, the 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 mechanisms of how women were, in a sense, disciplined into doing all this. Uh, a lot of it did not have to do with economic rewards before women entered the job market in large numbers. A lot of the mechanisms were basically social sanctions. You were ridiculed. You, were, you could not get a husband. This was a, you could not find a boyfriend. You were, not, uh, you were considered somehow not a real woman. So a lot of the mechanisms were sort of social sanctions or, or shame or ridicule or something like this, essentially social mechanisms. And I'm suggesting that now there's a more direct link to economic gains and losses. So now if you don't now because women are entering the, the, the job market in large numbers and their economic and, and professional success has become so important for them. Uh, now the failure to perform femininity right is actually directly tied to their possibilities of moving on in their careers. Uh, so this is one of the, the, the shifts that I am arguing has taken place. The other one is what normative feminine appearance now symbolizes. So if you think of um, Marilyn Monroe or 50s housewives or sort of exaggerated performances of femininity. They used to symbolize essentially um, subservi subservience. Um, they used to symbolize kind of weakness and domesticity and helplessness and uh, they were associated with um, traditional feminine uh, um, features like that. If you now think of women who perform femininity most successfully, they are women like uh, Hillary Clinton, or women who have a lot of money and power to buy all kinds of uh, uh, um, feminine, uh, uh, what, what would you call them, techniques. They are people who can spend money on cosmetic surgery and wrinkle creams and uh, facelifts and handbags and shoes and, you know, they are not secretaries or waitresses. They are actually people, women with power and money, and this, this ability to perform femininity successfully is a signal of that power. It's a signal that they have money and success and also often power, real power. So this is the other shift that I suggest has taken place. The, the, what successful performance of femininity now symbolizes. Um, okay, uh, Cooper's argument about that the, the, the responsibility has shifted to the nuclear family. Um, I would obviously have to, to look at the argument in more detail, but it seems to me that simply uh, in the light of sociological data, I mean, nuclear families just don't exist to the extent anymore that they used to. 
I mean, the numbers are really dwindling. Uh, the, the amount of people living alone is just increasing steadily. Uh, and the number of families with a single parent is also increasing uh, constantly. So it seems to me that, at least in light of this development, um, it's hard to see how the nuclear family can be the supporting block of the economic order. It, it's possibly, it can possibly, I mean, I'm not denying that it's still performing a, a very important function. It would be, um, it would be wrong to claim that it's disappeared. But I think its, it's, it's economic function has certainly changed. And the fact that now, at least in Western Europe, a nuclear family cannot economically support itself with just the husband's wage means that it's not the, the kind of economic unit it used to be is different. So, so it's so expensive now and the salaries have not caught up in real time that basically most families, both parents really have to work unless they are exceptionally uh, wealthy. Neoliberalism is formidably queer. Gay mama got serious. I first told you that I was a little bit sour. My name is Tatsin and I was a little bit the <laughs> <laughs> So what I've tried to uh, uh, suggest is that similar to the subject of feminism being women being split into extremes where, uh, where the economic disparities between these groups have become very pronounced and that this has uh, problems for building a unified political movement that this of course that this same development in a sense uh, is visible in the queer community at least in the, the, the countries that I'm familiar with because neoliberalism in general has made a huge uh, uh, difference in terms of, of incomes so the income gap between the, the poorest and the richest people in, in the in society, in neoliberal societies, has become expansive. This, of course, means that also the queer community must fall somewhere along the line of this range. So at least it is imaginable that there are very wealthy, professional uh, gay men who are actually benefiting from, from this, from these economic transformations, privatizations, deregularizations, and so on whilst there are other gay men who fall at the other end. And, and perhaps this is not something that has happened here. I, I don't know, but you seem to suggest that this is not the case in Georgia. But if it isn't, then at least you could, you could take my talk as a, as a kind of a, a warning or something that you should be, look out for, that the, that the LGBT community doesn't get economically stratified in this way where the, the, the people don't find it difficult to relate to each other because they live such different lives. Um, and where the, the, 
the, the, the people who actually benefit uh, from the neoliberal reforms find it very difficult to see uh, that the problems that the other members of the community are struggling with I have not been their own free choice, are not something that they themselves chose, but are in fact result of, of structural political conditions that need to be collectively transformed. So I think this would be my, my message in general terms. Um, and of course, Lika's question in a sense is similar, but in the context of feminism, what should we do uh, to not to end up with feminism that is actually part of the problem. That is actually, uh, women are aspiring for positions of power and economic success in which they become the oppressors and the exploiters. Um, and I think in some ways, I mean, some feminists would simply now demand that feminism is, should be seen as inseparable from some form of socialism. So we used to have, you know, different brands of feminism and socialist feminism was just one of them. And a lot of people are now saying that actually these two are inseparable because otherwise if we do not address the questions of economic disparity between different women, the emancipation of some comes at the cost of others. Now, of course, what we mean by socialism is a difficult question. And you, of course, have a, 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 a lot of historical baggage here. But I think that the kind of thing that we mean by socialism in the West is also insufficient. So a lot of the leftist attacks against neoliberalism have taken this form of, uh, of debating or resisting neoliberalism on the uh, playing field of economics. So if you think of Bernie Sanders' campaign, for example, a lot of the, the, the leftist socialist arguments in the West are framed in this economic framework where the idea is that we need to make some changes but this is actually good for the economy. So, for example, let's invest in clean tech and sustainable energy solutions. Uh, this will create a lot of jobs. This will actually be much better, make much more sense economically than sticking with old coal, coal uh, power plants. Uh, we, this, is, this will produce economic growth and a lot of economic opportunities. Or let's give free college education to all uh, students. Okay, this will cost a little bit of money in the, in the short run, but in the long run it will make a lot of economic sense. Uh, better educated workforce will increase the labor productivity. It will make us more competitive as an eco economy and the economy will actually grow much more. I think you're familiar with these kind of arguments, at least I am. So the leftist attack, the counterattack, or the leftist position takes this form of, of trying to sell the argument as making economic sense. And to me, this is a really bad strategy. This is, in a sense, accepting the neoliberal capitalist logic that economic growth is the most important thing. Never mind how we achieve it, this is the goal that we all agree on, and then we're just debating on what's the best way to achieve it. And if, if, if the left adopts this argument, we are going to lose, for sure. Because I think the neoliberal project has been the only thing it has been successful in is that it has managed to produce economic growth. The price has been terrible. 
uh, the cost of how it's done that has been devastating for the environment, for the people, for, for economic uh, disparities. Uh, but economic growth they can do. This is what they are good at. So if we try to engage them with this type of argument, uh, it's not, this is not the way to do it. We need to, in a sense, whatever our leftist or socialist demands are, they have to be framed in a way that, okay, college education costs money, but we want to pay for it because we think it's important, whether it makes economic sense or not. The environment is important. It will cost money to protect it, but there are things that are more important. So I think, uh, I think this is the kind of uh, politics that, uh, that socialist feminism needs to foreground. It needs to be able to question the whole framework that uh, analyzes things, analyzes social and political uh, situations from an economic rationality uh, viewpoint. And this, I think, in, in means building an intersectional movement. Because neoliberalism is such a, not just deep, but broad framework, feminists need to engage with a lot of other political groups and issues. For example, environmentalism uh, and other um, uh, social justice issues. I think this is our only hope for tackling these problems. Thank you.